you. We're very fortunate today to have Dr. Mark Harwood from Creation Ministries here to present to us. Mark has over 30 years of experience as an engineer and scientist in the Australian telecommunications industry. He played a key role in the development of Australia's national satellite system from its inception in 1980. As a real scientist, he is well equipped to understand the difference between the type of science that puts satellites into space, for example, and beliefs about past such as evolution. While at university, Mark was something of a closet Christian because he could not understand the basis of his faith. He assumed that God must have created through evolution, theistic evolution, but he came to realise that this provided no meaningful basis for Christ's sacrificial death on the cross. His subsequent journey of investigation convinced him of the theological and scientific basis of the Genesis history of the world, and that it was actually true and foundational to the Christian faith. Dr. Harwood, if you'd like to come up. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you very much, John, and uh, good morning, everyone. It's afternoon, isn't it? Yes, it's afternoon, well and truly. <laughs> well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a great privilege to be able to be with you and to share today. Um, it's just unfortunate I don't get to meet Pastor Stewart, um, but, you know, these things happen. We live in complicated and confusing times, don't we? And we have to be flexible at every step of the way, it seems. You might be wondering why we... Uh, worry about this issue of origins. But you know, one of the basic questions people ask, and I'm sure you've all asked it as well, is where did I come from? It's a sort of question that children ask. And it's not just about the birds and the bees, it's more fundamental than that, isn't it? How did this universe come to be? Where did it come from? So I want to share with you this morning on this very important subject of beginnings, of origins. Now you, are, you might be wondering, why is it so important? Why do organisations like Creation Ministries exist? I mean, aren't Christians just supposed to share the gospel and talk about Jesus? Why should we get involved in complicated things like origins? Isn't it just a side issue? A lot of people say that to me. But I don't... Well, if, if you think that way, you know, you're definitely not alone. But I think the issue of origins is actually fundamental to our understanding of who we are, understanding why we value certain things in our culture, why uh, or how we see other people, and importantly, how we see our Creator God, or even if we believe that there is one. So it's actually quite a fundamental issue. Now, we're often accused, scientists accuse the Christian of having blind faith. Someone said to me once, oh, I don't believe all that creation stuff. I follow the evidence. And I can kind of relate to that. I'm a scientist, I'm an engineer, you have to make things work, you measure things, make observations. You can't just go about your life with blind faith. So if you believe things in spite of the evidence, it's kind of um, an unsafe place to be, isn't it? You end up believing a lie. So if what the Bible tells us is true, you would expect that there would be some evidence to support it. And that's why I want to talk on this subject of going where the evidence leads. Because I think the evidence is overwhelmingly in favour of what the Bible actually says. Now, there's a conflict straight away because when you open up the Bible and start to read... The opening chapter tells us that God created everything in just six normal length days, just like the days we experience now. And uh, that's amazing, it's wonderful, but hang on a minute. <laughs> We're told today that the universe is billions of years old. So can we really believe that? The other important thing the Bible tells us that right at the very beginning, there was God. So there's if you like, a causal agent for the existence of the universe. God created the universe. There's a reason for us to be here. But the story that we're told in our culture is a very different one. It's a story that goes over 13.8 billion years of slow, gradual, random processes. Started off with uh, an explosion and here we all are today and all this complexity and everything that we see around us. Now, 
When I was growing up, I didn't know quite what to do with all this. I, was, uh, I became a Christian when I was 10 years old, grew up in a Christian family, but not in a, an environment that held the scriptures as, uh, as very authoritative. And so I just assumed that God must have used evolution to create. It seemed that all the scientific evidence was there for this, this Big Bang story. But it left me very confused, and there were a lot of questions that I couldn't answer. Questions, basic questions like, why did Jesus die? That's a pretty basic question for a Christian, isn't it? So as a young man, I didn't have an answer. You see, I reasoned like this. Why couldn't God have uh, sent his son to have shown us how to live a good life and uh, relate to our Heavenly Father and then have been transfigured up into heaven. Why the cross? So I went to the leadership of my church and asked the same question and sadly they couldn't answer. I got all sorts of explanations like Jesus identified with us in our suffering and so on but that wasn't very satisfactory. And it wasn't until after my postgraduate work that the Lord confronted me over this whole issue of origins. And I discovered two key things. The first is that I could believe what the Bible said. And the reason I could believe it is that the evidence in the world around us actually points to the truth of God's word. And I'll share some of that with you today. But the second thing was that I should believe it. Because the opening chapters of the Bible, the account of creation and the fall, are the very foundations of the whole gospel message. So if you take those opening chapters away, we don't have a coherent gospel. That's why I was a confused young man. So why is it that people believe that the universe is so incredibly old? Well, it's interesting that in our culture, we only allow naturalistic explanations for the universe. Now, that sounds okay if you're in the sciences, but if you think about it, if you limit yourself to natural explanations only, you're actually excluding right at the outset and arbitrarily any supernatural explanation. So if you reject the supernatural, that's the same as saying... There is no God. So undergirding the whole of the evolutionary story is in fact this assumption that there's no God. Now, if there's no God, that is what we call atheism. So it dawned on me that the evolutionary story is really an attempt to explain the existence of the entire universe without God. In other words, it's atheism in disguise or atheism dressed up in a lab coat. So it comes with all the authority of the scientific establishment and who could stand against that? I mean, these scientists are clever people, aren't they? They put men on the moon, they've got computers, mobile phones, all these amazing gadgets, and they tell us that the universe is 13.8 billion years old. But you see, it starts with an assumption, and that is that there is no God. Sometimes people say to me that um, this issue is, uh, is not really important and I want to share an extract from a letter that was sent to us and uh, I think that helps us to understand why it really is an important issue. And this guy wrote to us and said, I was raised in the church until my teens before rejecting it and declaring myself an atheist agnostic. The creation evolution issue was the number one sticking point for me. How could I possibly believe the Bible if it was wrong from the very start? That's a good point, isn't it? So you look at this book, the Bible, and you open it up, and the very first thing it says is wrong. Well, why are you going to read the rest? (laughs) And what other bits might be wrong? I mean, if that's wrong at the beginning, and then it says later on, for God so loved the world that he gave his, maybe that bit's wrong. And what about when it says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just, that maybe that's wrong too. But the worst thing is, how do you pick which bits are right and which bits are wrong? Now, I happen to believe that this book is God's word. Is anyone with me on that today? One or two of you, that's good. (laughs) But to say that the Bible is God's word is a faith statement. And I can't prove that in some kind of mathematical way. 
but it's a very defensible and reasonable faith statement. And that's what I want to share with you today. So does it matter? A very good friend of ours, Professor Richard Dawkins, <laughs> well, he is quite a good friend, actually. He gives us an abundance of wonderful quotes. But anyway, he was asked on a television program this question. Was there a particular point or something that you read or an experience that you had that said, yes, this is it, God doesn't exist? And Dawkins said, oh, well, by far the most important, I suppose, was understanding evolution. I think there really is a deep incompatibility between evolution and Christianity. And I think I realised that at the age of about 16. Isn't it interesting? Notice the age, 16. So many of our young people are leaving the church. Why? Well, they get along to high school and they're taught evolution. It's a fact. So how do you reconcile this fact of evolution with the Bible that says the Bible must be wrong? No wonder so many of them leave. But it's interesting, he says, there is a deep incompatibility between evolution and Christianity. What does he mean by that? Well, I think we could describe it like this. The evolutionary story has millions and millions of years of death and struggle and suffering before mankind even appears. That places death before man. But the Bible has it the other way around. It says that it was Adam's actions in the garden that brought death and suffering into the world. Now, those two versions of history are completely irreconcilable. And they are entirely consistent with what we read in the New Testament. So when Paul is expounding his theology of redemption, he says in Romans 5.12, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all sinned, so notice four things there. It says sin entered the world. So it wasn't there before. That's interesting. It came through one man, Adam. And what came with it? Death came through sin. And importantly, we all now die because we have all sinned against God. So this truly is a fundamental issue. In fact, the Bible goes on and says we are to always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but to do it with gentleness and respect. Now, when I was a young man, I couldn't do this. I don't mean the gentleness and respect bit. I mean, I didn't have answers to my questions, so I couldn't share with other people. I became a closet Christian. And as I said before, it wasn't until after my postgraduate work that the Lord really woke me up to this. Now, this isn't a suggestion, is it? This is an instruction to Christians to be prepared. So how do you get prepared? Well, it's what our ministry is about. Our heart is to see Christians prepared to give an answer to the challenges that our secular culture makes to our faith. And we've got all kinds of resources over there. I'll tell you a bit more about the Creation magazine later on. A lot of the illustrations I'm going to use this morning come from past issues of the magazine. We also have a website. This is what the front page looks like. There's a search window in the top right-hand corner there that gives you access to over 12,000 different articles and items of interest. An absolute goldmine of faith-building, God-honouring material. And uh, a new feature article there every day when we uh, encourage you to read that. Now, one of the good things about the website is it has a really easy web address to remember. But nonetheless, I learned a while ago that if you say something at the same time as seeing it, it helps to imprint it onto your memory. So I want you to say the web address with me when it comes up onto the screen. So is everyone ready for that? Yep. So if you want to know anything about creation, you just go to... Very good. Couldn't be easier, could it? So as John mentioned, I had the great privilege of working in the aerospace industry for some 30 or so years. I was involved in the design of all of Australia's national satellites. And uh, it was a, a great blessing to be able to work in that kind of a field. It was a lot of fun. Awesome, in fact. But the kind of science I was involved in is what you could call experimental science. And that's science based on observable, repeatable experiments. So if something goes wrong with uh, the satellites, for instance, 
We observe that, we do measurements, we work out what's gone wrong and you fix it. You've got to do that before it's launched, by the way, because when it's up there, you can't get there. But it's based on observable, repeatable experiments and that's the kind of science which, as I said before, gives us all these amazing gadgets that we just take for granted these days. And uh, that kind of science is rightly admired in our community. But there's another kind of science, it's what you might call historical science. Now it's still science but it has another dimension. And in historical science the scientist looks at evidence in the present and then he makes up a story about the past to explain what he's observing in the present. So this guy looks at this fossil in the rock and uh, he tries to interpret it and explain what it is. Now something interesting happens when a scientist makes up a story about the past. And if you think about it, it's inevitable. He engages his beliefs about the past. So if this guy believes the evolutionary story, 13.8 billion years, random unguided processes and so on, he might look at that little creature and think to himself, I wonder where it lives in that long, slow progression from the first primordial cell all the way up to complex organisms like you and me. I can imagine him thinking, I wonder how many millions of years ago it lived. So can you see that what he already believes influences how he interprets the data? But let's imagine he was a Bible-believing Christian. He looks at that fossil in the rock, he might think, you know, this little fossil was likely laid down as a result of Noah's flood, which would have deposited pretty much the whole of the fossil record all around the world today. So friends, that's a very different interpretation of exactly the same piece of evidence. So we don't actually argue about the evidence because we've all got the same fossils, rocks, stars, trees and so on. But our interpretation depends upon what we believe. So it's actually an issue of faith. So let's summarise that. Experimental science, it's about the present, observable, repeatable experiments. Historical science, it's about the unobservable, unrepeatable past. And interestingly, it's only in the area of historical science that any conflict occurs between the Bible and science. And no wonder the evolutionary story starts with the assumption there's no God and seeks to explain the universe. The Christian assumption begins with there is a God and we seek to explain the universe. Naturally, there will be a conflict. So how then do we get to the truth about our origins? We can't go back to the beginning, can we, to observe what happened? We weren't there, we've only got the present. But just imagine, a bit like the scene of a crime, if there was an eyewitness present, then their testimony would help to decide whether or not the accused in a court of law was guilty or innocent. What we need is an eyewitness of what happened, who's written down all we need to know about our beginnings. And friends, we've got exactly that in this book, the Bible. See, the Bible is like a history book of the universe. It's God's eyewitness record of what he did right at the beginning. It's more than just a history book, of course. It tells us how we can relate to our Heavenly Father. And interestingly, it also tells us all we need to know about what's going to happen in the future. And only God can tell us that. So I want to ask you a question today. Is your faith supported by evidence? And I want to use two images. This first one, the little girl is taking a tentative step into a, a pond or a lake. As you, as you can see there's, there's ground underneath the water. and All the evidence is telling her it's okay, but still takes a bit of faith to do it, doesn't it? And this image I want to use to describe a leap of faith. Now we just have to assume that this young fellow's checked how deep the water is, no rocks, all the rest of it. So this is um, believing something in spite of the evidence, in the absence of evidence, or even contrary to the evidence. If you were wandering around out in the countryside and you came across this rusty old car, you would know that at some point in the past, this vehicle was brand spanking new and shiny and it just rolled off the production line, right? It had a beginning. But there it is, running down, rusting away, but it hasn't yet completely disappeared. You know, our universe is like that. It is also running down. But it means, of course, that there had to have been a beginning. 
So as the universe, um, as the stars burn up their thermonuclear fuel, it gets dissipated as heat, and astrophysicists tell us that ultimately the universe, if nothing happens, will experience a heat death. So here it is running down, but it hasn't yet run down, so therefore it must have had a beginning. And the beginning that is generally accepted in our culture is called the Big Bang. And this diagram tries to depict the whole process. So 13.8 billion years ago, there's a quantum fluctuation when absolutely everything, nothing rather, absolutely nothing became absolutely everything. Initially, in the form of a hot plasma gas, which condensed down into hydrogen, finally collapsed into stars. Some of those stars burnt up all their fuel and exploded as supernovas. That led to more complex molecules. And finally, we had... Uh, uh, solar systems forming and our solar system and our planet condenses out of this swirling cloud of dust and gas and ultimately down there in the bottom right hand corner you can see that double helix molecule which is of course the DNA which contains the instructions for making every single living organism including you and me. So that's kind of diagrammatically the Big Bang story that we're taught today as a proven fact. I like this next little cartoon because it kind of sums it up in a rather tongue-in-cheek way. And the professor is saying to his students, now students, hydrogen is a gas which, if left long enough, turns into people. <laughs> well. <laughs> now, if this principle of an explosion leading to structure and order was actually true, we should experience that in our own lifetimes, in our own daily experience. But you know, every time I've seen or come across the results of an explosion, there's just a random scatter of debris. You don't get structure and order forming. Like for instance, this building didn't come about as the result of an explosion in a brick pit. Right? It was obviously designed, people brought raw materials, there was intelligence supplied and it was constructed and here we are. Now, this next image um, will come as a, a shock to many of you, so I just want to prepare you for that. And this is not my daughter's bedroom, right? <laughs> and I'm sure you've never seen anything like this before. <laughs> but if this idea of an explosion producing structure and order is true, then all you have to do is ask the young lady to leave the room, create an explosion, and hey presto, it's going to look like that. Now, I somehow doubt it, because to get to that stage, you probably require some discipline, and then some intelligence and hard work, right? Order and structure, such as we see everywhere, does not come about by chance. But then people say, ah, oh, yeah, but hang on, the Earth is not a closed system. So out there is the sun, and it's shining heat and light down onto the... And that is the mechanism by which structure comes out. Of, uh, of chaos. Well, here's an example of a very cleverly designed machine that takes the chemical bonds of petrol, uh, releases the energy from those bonds and converts that energy into mechanical energy to drive the gearbox of your car so that it moves along. So it's an example of a controlled application of raw energy in an intelligently designed environment. Now you could take exactly the same fuel and pour it over the car, and then you might end up with something like this. And that's an example of an uncontrolled application of the same raw energy, but in an unintelligent and undesigned environment. You see, just plain order, sorry, just plain energy cannot give rise to order. You need an intelligent agent acting on the materials. Professor Paul Davies summed this up very well. He said, the Big Bang represents the instantaneous suspension of physical laws, the sudden abrupt flash of lawlessness that allowed something to come out of nothing. It represents a true miracle. <laughs> and he's right. It really is a miracle. But can you see that it's actually a leap of faith to believe the universe made itself? It's a leap of faith because observable physics does not support that idea. But what a tiny step of faith to believe that the universe was made. 
Now, when we look into this history book of the universe, we discover some interesting things. There are various passages in it that I used to think were really boring, you know, the fathers and sons and all the begats and that stuff. But if you analyse them, you do come to some interesting conclusions. For instance, we can learn that Adam was 130 when his son Seth was born. And Seth was 105 when Enos was born. And all the way down to Noah, and it tells us that in the 600th year of Noah's life, the flood came. So you can just add those numbers up. They're all there in the book of Genesis. And you'll discover the flood occurred 1,656 years after the creation. So God has laid out for us a beautiful timetable that helps us measure the time from creation. In fact, across the top row there, all the way from Adam to Abraham, is about 2,000 years. And you can work all that out from just studying Genesis. And then from Abraham through to King David, and then via the line of Mary and the line of Joseph, we come to the time of Jesus. So from Abraham to Jesus is also about 2,000 years. Now, from the time of Jesus to the present day is about 2,000 years. So according to the Bible, not my idea, here we stand about 6,000 years after the creation. Wow, 6,000 years. I mean, how can anyone seriously believe that in this day and age? Surely the evidence for the vast antiquity of the earth is overwhelming. Well, maybe not. Let me share some things with you. Firstly, determining age. You know, age is not something that is measured. Scientists measure the physical and chemical properties of their samples, but you can't measure age. You only ever calculate ages. So let me give you an example. Let's imagine you've come around the corner of your house into the backyard and there's a, a bucket underneath a dripping tap. And uh, you measure the volume of water in the bucket and the rate at which the tap is dripping, as you do, of course, because you're scientifically inclined, right? And then you ask yourself this question, how long has the bucket been under the tap? Now, this is the first quiz for the morning, and you have to get this right, the afternoon, sorry. So if there's half a litre per hour is the drip rate, and if there's six litres of water in the bucket, how long has that bucket been under the tap? Any take? 12 hours. Who thinks 12 hours? Well, that's really good. OK, but your backyard has a resident historian. It's a very important backyard. And the historian has written down everything that happens in your backyard and gives you a document that tells you that the bucket was put there at 1.05 p.m. and you came round the corner at 1.50. Now you ask the question, how long has the bucket been there? Who wants to have a go at that? 45 minutes. Hang on a minute, all our measurements said 12 hours. But the eyewitness account's telling us 45 minutes. How can we reconcile those two? Any suggestions? Ah, maybe there was some water already in the bucket when it went under the tap. You see, our measurements are done in the present. We didn't see the bucket put there, we've just chanced upon the scene. Our science is being done in the present, like science always is. So we don't know that the bucket was empty when it went under the tap. So that's a good solution, right? That'll fix it. You work out how much water there had to be in the bucket already, and then we get 45 minutes, and that agrees with the historical record. Any other assumptions that we could maybe play with? Right, OK, so how do we know it's been dripping all the time? Someone could have turned the tap on hard, just filled it up, left the tap turned off carelessly, left it dripping just moments before you came around the corner. There's all sorts of... You just change the assumptions. You can get any answer you like. That's very, very important that we understand that. Ages are assumption-based. So let's summarise. Ages cannot be measured. They are always calculated, and the calculations are based on assumptions. You can get any age you like, depending on the assumptions you make. But the worst thing is you can't test the assumptions because you can't go back in time to observe what was happening. We only have the present, don't we? So the only way you can get an accurate age is from a reliable historical record. Now, I've got a, a document at home. It's called my birth certificate. And it tells me what day I was born on. There's no scientific experiment you can do on my body to determine, not that I'd let you, to determine my birth date. 
It's not a matter of science, it's a matter of history. So radiometric dating, which is what scientists use apparently to prove the vast age of the Earth, works a bit like this. There's a parent element that decays at a certain rate and produces what's called the daughter element. But it's a bit like the dripping tap in the bucket. See, we don't know the initial conditions, how much parent element was in the sample. Has some been added or has some been subtracted in the unobserved past? What about the daughter element? Same things. How do we know, in fact, that the decay rate has been constant? But all is not lost. What we can do is take some samples of known age and test them against the dates we get from laboratories. How do you get a rock of known age? Well, a really good way is to take a sample from the lava from a volcanic eruption. If the date of the eruption is known because it was observed and is a matter of history, then we know the age of that rock. And there's a clock called the potassium argon clock that starts ticking. Okay, and that allows us then to date the rocks and so on. And people have actually done that and have discovered that, for instance, rocks taken from the Mount St Helens lava dome that erupted back in 1980 were dated up to 2.8 million years old. So if you get dates for rocks of known age that are wrong, how can we have confidence that the dates of rocks with unknown age are in fact correct? So here are some interesting illustrations. Diamonds. Ladies, some of you here today may have a diamond on your fingers. It's called a girl's best friend, isn't it? Diamonds are believed to be billions of years old. Diamond is the hardest naturally occurring form of carbon. But there's an unstable form of carbon called carbon-14, and it decays away quite rapidly, relatively rapidly, such that if you could go forward in time, say 80,000 years or thereabouts, there would be absolutely no detectable carbon-14 at all. So naturally, with something as old as that, there would be no carbon-14 present in diamonds, so therefore no one had ever bothered to check, until some scientists did. And you know what they found? Every single sample had significant quantities of carbon-14, indicating that the diamonds are only thousands of years old not billions after all. We had an article in our creation magazine, we called it Diamonds, a creationist's best friend. Same applies to coal. It's supposed to be tens to hundreds of millions of years old, obviously can't be any carbon-14 present. Once again, every sample tested, there is significant levels, not just background levels. So that's telling us that the assumptions that we are presented with in the this secular society of ours, are not necessarily true and we need to test them and think about the data. But there are other mechanisms and clocks that we can observe. Here's a clock. It's um, the river systems around the world dump about 20 billion tonnes of mud and sediment onto the ocean floor every single year. So knowing how fast it's being added to the ocean floor and we can measure approximately how much is there, we can place an upper limit on the age of the ocean floors. And friends, it would all have got there in less than 12 million years. Now that's a disaster for the evolutionary story, because evolution says that the oceans have to be at least 3,000 million years old, not just 12. Here's another one, the population of the world today. We look around us, we estimate it's about 7.5 billion people. Do you know if you start with six people, Shem, Ham and Japheth, Noah's three sons and their wives, and let that population grow at the rate of just under half a percent for four and a half thousand years, which is the time back to the flood, you know what you get? About seven and a half billion people. So the population of the world today is exactly consistent with the Bible's record of history. But it's not consistent with the evolutionary story. Because, and by the way, that growth rate is quite conservative, so it more than adequately accounts for wars, famines and diseases. But the evolutionary story says that we've been here for 100,000 years, at least some people think a million. But if that's true, where are all the people? You see, we should be shoulder to shoulder on every square metre of the planet's surface, including the ocean basins. <laughs> but it's not like that, is it? 
So the Bible's record of history makes a lot more sense of what we observe in the world around us. In fact, I believe it's a leap of faith to believe that the earth is billions of years old. But what a tiny step of faith to believe that the earth is only thousands and not billions of years old. Let's turn our attention briefly to the area of geology because it was in the in the discipline of geology that this idea of the vast antiquity of the earth first arose. Now when you look at features like Grand Canyon we see these layers and layers and layers of rock and the story goes, now this is a story about the unobserved past right, the story goes that each layer is laid down after some flood or catastrophe of some description, then another layer and another layer and another layer and they take millions and millions of years to build up all these layers. And uh, then in the case of the Grand Canyon along comes the Colorado River and it erodes this massive canyon out. That must have taken millions of years. It's obvious, isn't it? But let's have a closer look. And here we see the boundary between what's called the Coconino Sandstone and the Hermit Formation underneath. And the contact is sharply defined, dead flat, and extends for hundreds of kilometres at Grand Canyon. Now the conventional story has it that the Hermit Formation is 10 million years older than the Coconino Sandstone. Okay, so let's think about that. The surface of the Hermit Shale, or formation as it is, lay there flat, horizontal, for 10 million years. Wouldn't you expect to see some evidence of elapsed time, like evidence of vegetation, tree roots, animal burrows, and the next time it rained, wouldn't there be erosion? I mean, the whole of this canyon is in fact supposedly the result of erosion. But friends, for the whole extent of that contact, there is no evidence of erosion anywhere. And that's actually true of layer after layer after layer. What it actually says is those layers were likely laid down rapidly one after the other with very little, if any, elapsed time between them. It speaks of a massive catastrophe of biblical proportions. So have we ever seen layers and layers of rock formed rapidly? Well, yes, we have. Back in 1980, Mount St. Helens in Washington State in the US erupted and it changed the geology around the base of the mountain. And one of the structures produced is called Little Grand Canyon. It's about 1 40th the size of the real Grand Canyon, about 40 metres deep in fact. But can you see on the walls those layers of rock? And there down in the bottom of the canyon is a little tiny river, so the conventional explanation would be layer upon layer upon layer, long period of time to build it up, the little river slowly carves out this thing 40 metres deep. Must have taken millions of years. But friends, none of that material was even there before 1980. How do we know? Well, we observed it to happen. Remember what science is about? Observation, isn't it? Not storytelling about the past, it's about observation. Now, two years after the eruption, there was a massive mud flow through that area when a natural dam breached, and that carved out Little Grand Canyon in just one day. That's all it took, one fortieth the size of Grand Canyon. Once again, how do we know? We observed it to happen. Well, the Bible tells us there was uh, an incredible cataclysmic watery disaster in the past. It's called the Flood of Noah. And it was an amazing event. The Bible says all the springs of the great deep burst forth. The floodgates of the heavens were open. The waters rose and increased greatly on the earth and the ark floated on the surface of the water. This was the greatest catastrophe to ever occur on the face of the earth. And yet, this is what we often see. Now, I'm sure you've all seen that kind of leaky bathtub image of the ark with a couple of giraffes necks sticking out the top and it's kind of cute. But sadly, it trivialises the enormity of the event. You see, it was nothing like that at all. The Bible tells us the ark was actually a huge vessel, over 140 metres long, got a semi-trailer there for scale. But if the flood had been a real true event, surely there would be evidence left behind. Now I've come from Sydney and New South Wales and we're still waiting for summer. Right? It hasn't turned up yet. 
We had an awful lot of rain and someone told me it's now autumn, so I think we've missed summer completely. But there are a lot of floods happening in the north coast that you've probably seen coverage of on the news. Even local floods do a lot of damage and leave evidence. Do you know that on every continent of the earth we find large-scale sedimentary rock deposits? And this is uh, on a beach just south of Sydney. You can see layer after layer of sedimentary rock. These are coal-bearing layers and interspersed between them are seams of volcanic ash. So it speaks of a massive watery disaster punctuated by volcanic eruptions. We find fossil tree trunks running through multiple layers of rock. If each layer took thousands of years to form, the tree would have rotted away long since. How come it's embedded right across so many layers? And then we see incredible folding patterns where all these layers of rock have been laid down and then they've been buckled and folded. Has anyone here tried to bend a rock? <laughs> what happens? <laughs> Just shatters, doesn't it? And yet these tight folds preserve the layers and the integrity of the rocks. You see, they must have been water-laden, soft and plastic, and as the mountains rose up, the Bible says, and the valley sank down at the subsidence of the flood, then the crustal movements would have buckled and compressed and those freshly laid sediments, and that is the result. I want to play you a short video clip from one of our DVDs over here called Evolution's Achilles Heels. And this has some amazing photography of water-formed mountain ranges. Have a listen. Oh, we haven't got sound. Don't seem to fit with this conventional view. Rock is brittle. It doesn't bend very easily. If you try and bend it, it breaks. Now, granted, on a big scale, you might be able to get some pretty big bends out of a large rock. But these bends are tight and close, and you can walk from one end of them to the other. This type of bend and folding without breaking the brittle rock uh, means that maybe it wasn't brittle rock at the time of its formation. These might have been much softer materials. After all, they were laid down during Noah's flood. They've been compacted down, started off horizontal, but then as the tectonic movements occurred, they shifted and folded them while they were probably still soft. So when we look at it this way, what we realize is that the really tall mountain chains, the Alps, the Rockies, the Himalayas, they didn't exist before the flood. The whole reason that they exist is because of the flood. So basically, when we look at the geology of the Earth, we find that present processes do not explain what we see. Rather, what we see points to catastrophic processes in the past, and when we think about what those could be, it fits exactly with the account in Genesis of Noah's flood, which destroyed the whole earth. So friends, I think it's a massive leap of faith to believe that gradual processes shaped the major features of the earth. Whereas, what a tiny step of faith to believe that a global flood best describes those major geological features. Now, I'm sure you've all uh, heard about fossils and the fossil record. You know, when scientists dig up a fossil, it doesn't have a tag attached to it to say how old it is. I know, I know that's kind of obvious. But what scientists can examine is the fossil itself. They can look at the physical and chemical properties. That's what you would call um, the facts. It's operational science. But when they make pronouncements about the age of the fossil, that's an interpretation. That's historical science. They're reflecting what they already believe happened in the past. So the big question is, what is it that happened to the dinosaurs? Now, the paleontologists have correctly recognised that there was some past catastrophic event that wiped them out. Sadly, most of them reject the history book of the universe, so they've come up with all kinds of creative suggestions. I don't have time to look at those now, but it's interesting to see what the Bible says happened to the dinosaurs. So let me share with you some interesting facts. First of all, it tells us that God made all the land-dwelling creatures on the sixth day of creation. It also says that God made mankind on the sixth day of creation. Now, from those two statements, we can reach a logical conclusion. 
Who wants to tell me? What can we conclude from those two statements? Sorry? Um, dinosaurs lived together. Yeah. Dinosaurs and man lived together. It's obvious, isn't it? Now, hang on a minute. <laughs> no one in our culture takes that seriously. I mean, we're told the dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago. In fact, no living human being could ever have seen a dinosaur if that was true. But according to the Bible, it says we lived together. Interesting. We've just seen, um, well, I didn't actually cover this off, but pairs of all creatures, seven of some, came to Noah and went on board the ark. Logical conclusion, two of every kind of dinosaur must therefore have been on the ark. And then every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. Only Noah and those with him survived. So logically, all the dinosaurs not on the ark drowned in the flood. So there really was a global catastrophe that occurred. In fact, there are three whole chapters in the book of Genesis devoted to the flood of Noah. Now, when you go to museums these days, you often see the skeletal remains of the dinosaurs assembled in their standing position, so you can see how big they are. Now, not all of them are big, by the way. Some are just the size of chickens. But the big ones were really big. But I like, rather, to see the exhibits where they show you how they found the bones. And that's really interesting. So here's an example. They are typically in what's called the epistatonic posture. That's a great word. You should memorise it. Next time you're at a party, you can impress your friends. <laughs> so long as you're not in that position, of course. But what it means is that the neck is bent back, the arms and legs are outstretched, the tail is extended. It's the position an animal adopts under acute oxygen deprivation prior to death through suffocation or drowning. Isn't that interesting? It is so common, it's called the dinosaur death throes position. And paleontologists wonder, why are so many dinosaurs in this position? Now, a few years ago, my wife and I had the privilege of going to uh, the Royal Tyrell Museum in Alberta in Canada, one of the world's leading dinosaur museums. And uh, there are all sorts of these exhibits here. This is a Gorgosaurus, once again, the classic dinosaur death throes position. And one of the most impressive was Black Beauty, which is a T-Rex. And you can see it there, neck arched back, the classic epistatonic posture again down in the right-hand side at the front there. You can just see my wife to give you some sense of the scale. This is a big animal. And yet it's been dumped on by so much mud and sediment that it's been trapped there in the rocks where it suffocated and died. It speaks of a massive catastrophe not just a local flood. Well, it gets more interesting because in Genesis chapter 8, it says that all the animals came out of the ark, one kind after another. Logical conclusion, two of every kind of dinosaur must have survived the flood. <clears throat> wow, that's a bit interesting. I guess the ones that did would have been pretty happy. But what is the evidence... What is the evidence for when the dinosaurs died out? Was it 65 million years ago? There was a paleontologist called Mary Schweitzer. She was examining a T-Rex bone and she found, to her amazement, that it had red blood cells inside. She said it was exactly like looking at a slice of modern bone, but of course I couldn't believe it. I said to the lab technician, the bones, after all, are 65 million years old. How does she know that? Well, it's what she's been taught from primary school, high school, university, and not unreasonably, it's what she believes. But the evidence in front of her very eyes is to the contrary. And she asks, how could blood cells survive that long? Well, they can't. Nowhere near it. So the observable evidence, real science, tells her that this animal did not die 65 million years ago, but much more recently than that. A little while later, they found the female, the thigh bone of a T-Rex. It was so big they couldn't fit it in their helicopter. They cut the bone in two and discovered that it had soft tissue that was flexible and resilient and when stretched, returned to its original shape. And Mary Schweitzer said, this is not something I ever dreamed I would see. Now, it's not just Mary Schweitzer finding soft tissue. Other scientists have reported finding collagen fibres, um, various proteins and even fragments of DNA. 
So don't worry, Jurassic Park isn't going to happen. <laughs> but this caused a storm in paleontological circles, as you might imagine, and people didn't want to believe it. So 60 Minutes interviewed Mary Schweitzer, and I want to play a short clip out of that interview. And I want you to think about it because in this clip there is one assumption that is not challenged. Okay, so I want you to think about it. What happened next happened by mistake. Mary put some fragments of the bone in acid to dissolve away the outermost layer of mineral. But the acid worked too fast and all the mineral dissolved away. Being a fossil, there should have been nothing left. But there was, and it was elastic, like living tissue. This is the piece. <gasps> no. She showed us video she took under the microscope. That's really what happened? Yes. That's the dinosaur yeah. bone? Without mineral now. That's what was left. It looked like the soft tissue she would have expected to find if it had been modern bone. This was impossible. This bone was 68 million years old. So you see this and you think, what? You see, I didn't want to tell anybody. <laughs> You'd be ridiculed, yes. right? And so I, I said to my technician, OK, do it again. I don't believe it. And yet, in sample after sample, they were there. Things that looked suspiciously like flexible, transparent blood vessels. She finally mustered the courage to tell Jack. She said she dissolved the bone away and there were blood vessels. And, you know, I was like, shocked. I mean, How could that be? How could that be? That's right. The things Mary was finding inside dinosaur bones. Look at that. Blood vessels and even what seemed to be intact cells pose a radical challenge to the existing rules of science, that organic material can't possibly survive even a million years, let alone 68 million. Fascinating, isn't it? There's the evidence right in front of their eyes. So what is the assumption that is not challenged in that interview? The age, exactly. So why won't the evolutionist challenge the age? Well. Friends, if the millions of years are not true, there has not been enough time for evolution to take place. And if evolution is not true, what are you left with? A creator God. And people don't want that. Because if there's a God who made me, who created this universe, I may be held accountable for how I've lived my life. And people don't want to accept that accountability. And so it's rejected. Now, it's interesting, but in many different people groups around the world, there are stories about encounters between people and huge beasts. They're normally called dragons, like St George and the Dragon. And here at Ta Prom in Cambodia, there's a temple reclaimed from the jungle. It's got all kinds of uh, stone carvings around it, including this one of an animal with bony plates on its back. Now, what sort of animal do you reckon that is? A stegosaurus, right. Now the problem is, 800 years ago when that was carved, there were no paleontologists around to tell those people that the animal they were carving was actually extinct. I'll let you think about that. <laughs> you see, what they carved is what they saw, exactly. My wife and I were in uh, the city of Carlisle in northern England and uh, in the cathedral at Carlisle is the tomb of a guy called Bishop Bell. Surrounding his tomb is this uh, brass inlay and embedded on that are uh, etched images of an eel, of a fish, a dog with a collar, a bird and then in the middle of them all are these two creatures with long intertwined necks and what appear to be bony protrusions on their tails. Interestingly, they depict them with the tails elevated. Now, you look at that and you think, probably a sauropod dinosaur, a bit worn from centuries of choir boys' feet shuffling over them. But not that long ago, the skeletal remains of a Shunosaurus was found. And interestingly, it's a sauropod, but it has spikes on its tail and it has its tail elevated. Now, for a long time, when... Um, sauropods were reconstructed in museums, the tails were shown dragging. But then paleontologists figured out from the bone structure they must have held them aloft and used them sort of like as a, as a balance as they walked. So those artisans 500 years ago in northern England got it right. How? 
because they saw one. We had an article about it in our creation magazine. So what happened to the dinosaurs that came off the ark? Well, there are a number of mechanisms of extinction. I'm sure many of them would have been hunted. The big ones would have been very dangerous and inconvenient. Loss of habitat, predation and so on. But I think we can make a very strong case that the dinosaurs of history are actually one and the same as the dragons we read about in legends. So it really is a leap of faith to believe that the dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago because the observable evidence says that's not true. But what a tiny step of faith to believe that they died in the flood but two of every kind survived. Now, I just want to touch on one other topic quickly. I know time is marching on, but we hear much about fossils and fossils are often found in huge graveyards with uh, jumbled up different uh, types of animals in the same place. And uh, we hear much about how fossils form and our biology textbooks, um, and you'll see this on interpretive signs, tell us a story about long, slow, gradual processes. Here's one such interpretive sign and it depicts a little fish swimming happily in a lake. The fish dies, sinks to the bottom, some sediment gets swept in, covers over the body, and then ultimately it becomes a fossil. Now, friends, that's a story about the unobserved past. So that's historical science. But we can do some observable science. So does anyone here keep fish, or have you ever kept fish? Anyone? Yep, one or two of you. So if your fish died, do they sink to the bottom of the tank, or do they float to the top? They almost always float to the top, right? Not in every case, but by far the majority. And in nature, when the fish floats to the top, what happens then? Gets eaten, doesn't it? Other fish eat it, birds will pick at it. Before long, there's just a few bony remains. It'll sink to the bottom, and the crustaceans get rid of those. Now, you can check it out, if you don't believe me. Next time you're down at the ocean, go snorkelling, scuba diving, look down at the ocean floor. Will you see all those dead fish lying there waiting to become fossils? No. <laughs> it's not like that. You see, to form a fossil, you need special conditions, one of which is rapid and deep burial so that no predators can get to the body and so you limit the amount of oxygen that will reach it so it doesn't rot away. Here are some interesting examples. This creature is uh, an extinct um, marine reptile called an ichthyosaur and I just accidentally pressed the button twice. I've given away the next hint. This turns out to be a female ichthyosaur. So can you tell how I know it's a female? It's got nice, cute eyelashes. and <laughs> It's giving birth, that's right. You can see the baby ichthyosaur emerging from the mother's birth canal. So, you know, ladies, I've heard of long labours, but not thousands of years, right? This thing was dumped on by tons of sediment and just snap frozen in time and there it is. This little guy didn't get time to finish eating his lunch. <laughs> you see the fossil record is a mute testimony to a violent watery global catastrophe. That's what Genesis 6, 7 and 8 describes exactly. It doesn't prove the Bible but it's consistent with the Bible's record of history. So how do fish fossils form? Well, little fish is swimming, happling along, gets dumped on by tons of mud and sediment, ends up trapped in the layers of rock, whereupon it dutifully becomes a fossil. But the big question is, where are the intermediate fossils? Now, Charles Darwin recognised a weakness in his own theory, and he said, why then is not every geological formation and every stratum full of such intermediate links? Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain. And this perhaps is the most obvious and serious objection that can be urged against the theory. So that was written in 19, uh, 1871, rather. And, um, no, sorry, that was written back in the publication of The Origin, which was 1859. Now, he felt that maybe the fossil record was just so incomplete that when more and more is found, it would confirm his theory. But 160-something years later, Dr Colin Patterson wrote a book uh, about fossils and someone wrote to him about that book. Patterson wrote back and said, I fully agree with your comments on the lack of direct illustration of evolutionary transitions in my book. If I knew of any, fossil or living, I would certainly have included them. I will lay it on the line 
there is not one such fossil for which one could make a watertight argument. Now that's a very revealing admission, isn't it? There are no transitional forms because the transitions from one kind of creature to another never actually happened. So here's uh, an extract from um, uh, a display at the Chicago Field Museum of Natural History. It's the dinosaur family tree. And down the side here, we have the number of fossils providing evidence for the different sorts of dinosaurs. And then at each of the junctions, we have the fossil record of those branches. And you'll discover that there's absolutely no evidence at all. All we have is the evidence of the final forms, no transitions. This is from Science Journal, a fairly complicated diagram that sought to explain it all. So uh, somebody carefully drew all the other links there in red and blue. But if you take those away, do you find all that ancestral linkage that's supposed to be there in the family tree of dinosaurs? Well, no, you don't. The tree just disappears. Now, friends, I'm sure that you have all familiar with this uh, iconic image of the ape to man. You know, it's just so embedded. It's in all the textbooks and the TV documentaries. We evolved from apes, right? That's how the story goes. Well, I want to play you a short video clip that looks at the evidence, and I think it sums it up much better than I could. And my colleague, Scott Devlin, put this together for us. You may recognise this image from school textbooks, T-shirts, soda adverts, and everything in between. But what if I were to tell you that if we're to be honest with the evidence that we have, this picture should look more like this? Let me explain. On the left is what is believed to be the first ape known as Proconsul, and on the right is a human called Homo sapiens. But what scientific evidence is there for everything else in this image? The transitional species. Let's find out. We'll start with Homo neanderthalensis. You might know him as Neanderthal man. Recent discoveries have shown that Neanderthal man made and wore jewelry, played instruments, used tools, and wore makeup. We've even found that his brain was the same or slightly larger than the average human living today. In other words, Neanderthal man was actually just a man. What about Homo erectus? Recent discoveries have shown that Homo erectus made tools, engaged in artwork, spoke intelligent language, and made and sailed boats. In other words, Homo erectus was also just a man. Now, we'll come back to Homo habilis in a moment, but first, let me show you something. Have you ever heard of Lucy, the most famous so-called ape man, paraded in our museums, one of the very first Australopithecus afarensis species ever to be found? But what does the evidence reveal? She had a skull that was sloped and ape-like, nothing like human skulls, fingers that were curved, not at all like human fingers, toes that were curved, not at all like human toes, wrists that had the ability to lock for knuckle walking, and a knee structure that was compatible with life in trees. So Lucy and her kind swung from trees and looked like today's apes. Lucy is an extinct type of ape. As we've just seen, Homo sapiens, Neanderthal man, and Homo erectus were all men. Australopithecus afarensis and Proconsul were both apes. Considering the ubiquity of the evolutionary icon, we'd really want to see some strong evidence for Homo habilis, the pivotal point of transition between stoop ape and upright man, between basic instinct and intelligent thought, between animal noise and intelligent speech. The only problem is, in the words of Ian Tattersall, Homo habilis is a wastebasket taxon little more than a convenient recipient for a motley assortment of hominin fossils. Other scientists referred to him as a garbage bag because the bones we have for him are a mixture of human and ape bones. In other words, Homo habilis never existed. I think evolutionary professor Bernard Woods sums this up well. Our progress from ape to human looks so smooth, so tidy, it's such a beguiling image that even the experts are at loathe to let it go. But it is an illusion. With the lack of evidence and agreement on the ape human transition forms, why is this not happening? Or this. 
and is a better explanation that man and apes have always coexisted and reproduced according to their own kind, as stated in Genesis 1. Excellent little summary, isn't it? You know, I think evolution is the substance of fossils hoped for and the evidence of links not seen. <clears throat> Apologies to the author of Hebrews 11.1. 1. So it's actually a leap of faith to believe that the fossil record shows evolution over eons of time because it actually does not support it. But what a tiny step of faith to believe that the fossil record shows the order of burial by the flood. Now, friends, right back at the beginning, I use this scripture. We are always to be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you the reason for the hope that you have. So our heart is that you are equipped with the resources, with the answers, to be able to give an account of your faith. Anyone here want to be prepared? Do you want to have answers to these questions? Have you ever been asked these kinds of questions? Yeah, we get them all the time, don't they? Don't we, rather? So I mentioned earlier at the beginning that uh, we have a website, which is an absolute goldmine of resource. Don't forget, creation.com. We also provide a regular email newsletter service, which gives like a, a summary, if you will, of the best of the articles that have been published uh, daily on the, on the website. And um, these articles, uh, by the way, if, when you get that email, uh, it will tell you if there are any events in your local area. And the first one you get gives you access via a code to a free video download from the website. You can follow us on the various uh, social media platforms. And the way to do that, when you came in, hopefully you would have received one of these little bookmarks. Now, if you didn't get one, just wave your hand and our, one of our team will, will give you one of these bookmarks. A few people haven't got them, guys, if you could help us out. So there are six different types of these. On the front is a question, on the back is an answer to that question, which can really only be given from a, a biblical perspective. But also, on the bottom, at the back, is one of those dreaded QR codes. Um, I'm sure you're all very expert at those. If you scan the QR code, it gives you access to the Infobytes newsletter service, and also you can follow us on um, the social media. Importantly, is the Creation magazine. This is the latest issue of the magazine that's come out. You're missing one there, David, behind you. There's uh, some people missing. Or do you want to collect all six, do you? <laughs> the Creation magazine is a fabulous resource. It's written for lay people. You don't have to be a scientist to understand it. And it is just gold because it helps answer your own questions. It also gives you something that you can give to other people. And uh, that is a wonderful help. There's a children's section in the middle of it. And kids love that. And uh, it's a great witnessing tool. Now, you can subscribe for one or three years, and with every subscription, you'll get a free back issue of the magazine, so you have something to take away and read and then hopefully give away. If you give us your email address, then you'll get a digital version of the magazine, which can be shared with up to five different devices with every single issue. I love this testimony we received. I was converted when someone gave me a creation magazine. Isn't that good? Someone just gave this person a magazine. It's totally changed their lives. They're now in the kingdom. But I love what he did next. He said, then I subscribed for five of my relatives. Four of them have now come to the Lord. How good is that? So, friends, to get equipped with the magazine, over on the tables there you'll find one of these forms. Just fill out the details so we know where to send it. Perhaps I could ask who here already subscribes to Creation Magazine? Anyone? Just a few people? Oh, a few people. That's good. Well, if you're already a subscriber, you might consider giving a gift subscription to a member of your family or a friend. Now, if you subscribe for three years, along with the back issue that you'll get, you also have access to this $15 voucher at the foot of the form. So just take that to the sales table and you can apply that to any purchase on the tables there today. And a great way of spending your $15 is to buy a Creation Answers book. It consists of 20 short chapters that address the most asked questions that Christians and non-Christians alike have. Things like, how do I know there's a God? Uh, where did all the water go after the flood? And what about carbon dating? We talked about that, didn't we? And the classic question, where did Cain get his wife? 
It's amazing how often that question comes up. All there answered in the answer, answers book. Now we've packaged that together with a DVD on the big picture called A Brief But True History of Time and this little blue book, uh, Refuting Evolution. And uh, that pack is discounted, so it's like buying two of those things and getting the third one for free. We have a number of uh, more advanced materials over there. Evolution's Achilles' Heels and its companion DVD. And I played uh, several clips out of that DVD. This is a great book to look at this whole question of the age of the Earth, the deep time deception. You may know students in your family or friends who are heading off to university or late years in high school. It's called the Creation Survival Guide, how to graduate with your faith intact, some very wise advice. And hot off the press are two new children's books in the Please Nana series. This one, Please Nana, Why Was Jesus Born? And this one, Please Nana, What is a Miracle? This is also a new book, Biblical Geology 101. I haven't yet had a chance to read it yet, but on all reports, uh, it's an excellent piece of work. And all of our videos and so on are available for, uh, to stream from our website. So friends, let me try and wrap all this up. The evolutionary story places millions and millions of years of death and struggle and suffering before mankind. The Bible, however, says it was Adam's actions in the garden that brought death and suffering into this world. That's why the world's a mess. That's why we're full of wars and strife and disease and, and so on, emotional anguish, all the rest of it. God didn't make the world like that. He created a perfect world. We messed it up by rebelling against him. And that is why Jesus came. He came to rescue us from the mess that we have made. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So Jesus came, paid the price for our sin, which was death, so that we could go free. What an awesome gospel message we have to share. So friends, remember, when we talk about the gospel message and about Jesus, first of all, we're talking about the creator of the universe who became our perfect sinless sacrifice. He paid the price for us, that great exchange of the just for the unjust. He's... He's the risen saviour who has defeated death and that gives a hope for every single believer for an eternal future. He's the lover of our souls, the giver of the Holy Spirit. He's the intercessor seated at the right hand of God the Father. The Bible says he's the soon coming king and I believe it's not too much longer before he comes. And he's the bridegroom seated at that wedding feast to which we have all been invited. So friends, if you're a believer here today, I want to encourage you to get equipped so that you can share your faith with confidence, knowing that you stand on the absolute rock-solid word of God. It is indeed the truth. Perhaps you're not a believer here today. I would encourage you to take that step of faith. You see, it's not about trying to do enough good things to earn 51% at the end and pass. <laughs> it's not possible. God lays down the way. It's through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to believe that he's indeed the Son of God. In Romans it says, uh, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That means you'll be rescued at that final day. So Lord, uh, folks, I would encourage you to take that step. So thank you very much for listening and for your attention this morning. And uh, it's been a great privilege to share with you. But I'd just like to close the service now with a word of prayer. Perhaps we could all stand. Heavenly Father, it is with grateful hearts that we come before you today. Grateful for the amazing plan of salvation that you put in place through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, that you paid the price, the price that we could not pay so that we could go free. Thank you, Father, that not only have you given us your word, which is the truth, but you have provided us with an, 
abundance of evidence in every area of the world around us, all of which points to the truth of your word. So truly, it's just a tiny step of faith to believe. Thank you, Lord, for opening the way to us for eternal life. And now, Father, I just ask that your presence will be with each and every one of us as we go our separate ways. And we ask, Lord, for your blessing on us in Jesus' mighty name. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.